From the beginning, the fundamental question for man has been, will we take God at his word? To use the language of our catechism, will we receive God's word with faith and love, laying it up in our hearts and practicing it in our lives or not? And this is a question that goes all the way back to the garden. Adam, the first human being, he was created by God. He was placed in an environment surrounded with the revelation of God. All around him, creation was proclaiming the glory of God. Everywhere he looked, he beheld the face of God, the one true triune God. Adam was alive in the theater of God, as Calvin loved to call the world. And further within Adam, the law of God was written on his heart. He was created in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness as an image bearer of God. All of this meaning that by nature, from within and without, Adam knew God. He came forth from the dust of the earth, filled with the Spirit, naturally knowing God. It was a natural bond of religious fellowship, antithetical to the doctrine of the image of God taught by the Roman Catholic Church, which demands a superadded gift for this very thing. And yet, this general or natural revelation of God within and without the light of nature and the work of creation, it was immediately accompanied by special revelation, pre-redemptive special revelation, a covenantal word wherein God, the king of the covenant, tells Adam, his son, servant, to refrain from eating from a particular tree upon the pains of death spiritual, physical, and eternal, with the promise coming alongside of confirmed eternal life in a heavenized world which could never be lost if obeyed. Adam was under probation. Those are the parties, God and man, Adam as our federal head. Those are the terms of the covenant, the terms being special revelation, a word from God. And we know the rest of the story. Most do, I assume. The sin-filled serpent who had fallen from heaven, he comes into this garden temple of God, testing and tempting Adam, questioning and contradicting the word of God. That's immediately where he goes. And this results in Adam sinning, not taking God at his word. He submits to the serpent in unbelief, not taking God at his special revelation. And as a result, our federal head, Adam, who represents us in the garden, he takes all of us, all of mankind, into sin and death. Romans 5.18 says, One trespass led to condemnation for all men. And therefore we can see that faith, which is taking God at his word, as we've, as we've come to that conclusion in Hebrews 11, 1 through up to where we are now, we can see that this is foundational even at creation, not just in the context of redemption. And though Adam sins, resulting in the fall of mankind and the curse of death in its fullness, spiritual, physical, and eternal, ultimately resulting in the lake of fire, Even though this all happens, redemption is immediately inaugurated. Salvation through a promised Savior, another representative, who would and now has perfectly obeyed God, unlike Adam, while also bearing the penalty for our sin, Adam's and ours. And we know that to be Jesus Christ, the last Adam, as Paul calls him, the one who came who was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, where he bore the full weight of the wrath of God for us as his people. And for what purpose? That we now, on this side of the fall, might still have eternal life with God in an heavenized world which can never be lost. The very promise held out to the first Adam. 
And how do we obtain this eternal life? Justification, adoption, resurrection from the dead, which is still future. And all other benefits in the covenant of grace. All for the sake, all serving our eternal communion with the triune God in a new world. How is this obtained? By faith. And therefore, even as we move from creation through the fall to redemption, faith is still central. And this is clear in Hebrews as a whole, but especially in chapter 11. The bottom line is faith is what should have marked Adam in the very beginning. And later, faith is what marked Abel, his son, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, all being justified and commended on account of their faith, all taking God at his word. And today, we will see that faith is what marked Sarah as well, the barren wife of of Abraham, the one, the man with his wife to whom the promises were made. Now, this morning, as we consider verses 11 and 12, and Sarah as a model believer, we're going to see three things from the text. There's plenty more, but three things we'll focus on. Number one, we're going to consider the good fight of Sarah's faith. Fighting the good fight of the faith. Second, we will consider the foundation of her faith. And then third, we will consider why Abraham and Sarah together as models of faith should have a great effect on the Hebrews to whom he is writing, the, to the, the pastor is writing, and by extension to us. We will consider all three of these points, seeing how it ought to encourage us and spur us on as believers, pilgrims in this wilderness world until we enter glory and faith gives way to sight. Now, it is very interesting, I think, that the writer of Hebrews begins immediately in verse 11 with Sarah, attributing faith to her. But if we remember the story, it's not actually that simple, is it? The writer of Hebrews is moving from the promised land now to the promised seed, which includes Sarah. And yet, if you recall, when the Lord comes promising to Abraham and Sarah, this son, this promised seed, through whom a great multitude will come, through whom blessing will come to all the ends of the earth, what does Sarah do? Well, in unbelief, she gives Hagar to Abraham. And then later on, when it's, Repeated, she laughs in doubt. In Genesis 18, starting in verse 9, this is what we are told. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of woman had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord Abraham, that's her Lord there, is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. That's what happened at first. When she's told at first, she laughs in doubt. And yet here, in the single most important chapter on faith in all of Scripture, she's mentioned as a model believer with no mention of her doubt. And further, in connection with her faith, Isaac is conceived, the child of promise, the commendation of her faith. And what does this teach us? 
It teaches us so basically that even if we have our doubts, even if there is a wrestling, a struggling, as we fight the good fight of faith and wage warfare, as long as we repent, believe, press on, and don't allow doubt and distrust to win the day, the Lord is pleased. Calvin confirms this, or more properly, I agree with Calvin. He says, it must be confessed that her faith was mixed with distrust. But since she corrected her distrust when warned, her faith was recognized and praised by God. What she at first rejected as incredible, she obediently accepted as soon as she heard that it came from the mouth of God. From this we deduce a useful piece of teaching, that even when our faith wavers or halts a bit, it does not cease to be approved by God, provided we do not give way to our distrust. Therefore, if you are a believer this morning, though struggling may be, Let us be encouraged by Sarah and let us say with the man in the Gospels, I believe, help my unbelief. But understand that we are not seeking to justify doubt. That is not what we are doing and that is not what I am saying. We are not justifying doubt or unbelief in any way. But we are to be encouraged that doubts do not win the day for God's people. They cannot. Having doubts does not damn us as long as we repent and believe. Therefore, let this, by way of example, encourage us to immediately correct our doubts, bringing our thoughts and our faith into alignment with the word of God, no matter how incredible, how impossible it all might seem. This is our life. Our faith is not perfect, but our Savior is. Our faith will be assailed. Doubts will creep in. We will sometimes think too highly of a situation and too little of God. But be encouraged. It isn't a perfect faith that saves, but faith in a perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter tells us that the roaring lion, the devil, is prowling around, seeking whom he may devour And what do you think he's trying to destroy? Our faith. He creeps in saying, did God really say? He creeps in contradicting what God has said. And this is why we are commanded as God's pilgrim people to fight the good fight of faith. We are the church militant. Fighting. It's in our blood. We are to wage warfare, and there is no easy day. We are the church militant on earth, which implies blood, sweat, and tears, which implies combat. And therefore, we must be constantly repenting of our doubts, trusting in the Lord who has spoken in his word, and yet be encouraged, brothers and sisters, If you are in Jesus Christ this morning by faith, understand and be encouraged that for the true believer, we will overcome. Our confession, our magisterial confession, chapter 14, paragraph 3 says, This faith is different in degrees, weak or strong. It may be often in many ways assailed and weakened, but gets the victory. Therefore, let this first point be an encouragement for us. Yet let us not presume either. Let us not be satisfied with our doubts in accordance with the word of God, and especially the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us not be satisfied with little faith, and especially not unbelief. We must repent of all of these things. If you do not believe this morning, repent of your unbelief and trust in the Lord. The point is that Sarah is an example of doubt not having the last word. 
the victory. Faith did as a work of the Spirit in her life. And so if you are doubting this morning, correct your doubts, submit in faith to the word of God, every word that comes from his mouth, knowing that nothing is impossible for God. Let us think so highly of God that in comparison we think little of all else that seems to stand in his way at every point. And let us not rest until we in Christ overcome all doubt. Truly believing all that the Lord has promised us and nothing more, but nothing less. Trusting in, resting in, not our faith which ebbs and flows, but Jesus Christ who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, as we think about Sarah's doubt giving way to faith, the next thing for us to consider in the text is what was the foundation for Sarah's faith? We've said over and over again that faith takes God at his word. And we do see that at the end of verse 11. God made a promise and Sarah finally did believe that promise. But the text actually goes further down. Sarah isn't just trusting in a promise, but in the one who promised. Do you see? That's a distinction. Inseparable, but a distinction. The text says she considered him faithful who had promised. So we actually have two things in view. We have the promise and we have the one who promised. And which is primary? Well, if you have to pick, the one promising is primary, the ultimate foundation. Because if the one promising wasn't worth believing, would the promise be worth believing? Absolutely not. We are commanded not to trust deceivers, to trust liars, those who are not faithful and trustworthy, those who do not keep their word, but the Lord is none of these things. And this way, as Gerhardus Voss distinguishes, there's an antecedent trust and a consequent trust. And all that that means is that we have Before a promise can be trusted, the one promising must be known to be trustworthy, worthy of our trust. And this is where the writer of Hebrews is taking us. Faith takes God at his word because God himself, the one speaking, is faithful or trustworthy. Sarah knew this and so must we. The faithfulness of God, the foundation for her believing, means that God always keeps his word. And therefore, he is a rock upon whom we can stand and live by faith. He never breaks a promise. And this is a theme found over and over again in the scriptures. Hebrews 6, 17 through 18, as an example When God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. Exodus 34, 6 which we read this morning. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The reason that Sarah could move from doubt to faith and trust in the Lord who promised is because she knew and saw that he himself, the one who promises, is faithful. What he says he does and what he promises he brings to pass without a caveat. The Exodus event, the great gospel of the Old Testament, a type of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it was the result of God's promise making and keeping. All of it. In Exodus chapter 2, 23, during those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. 
Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. Now listen very carefully. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Do you see what just happened? God made a promise to Abraham regarding his people. And now the time has come wherein God is going to fulfill and keep that promise, doing marvelous things to get it done. Israel inheriting the land under Joshua, that was a result of God's promise. Joshua 21, 45, not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed, all came to pass. Do you see this pattern? God promises and God does. Exodus, land. And the coming of Jesus Christ himself, through all the names listed in his genealogy, surprising names, all under the providential guidance of his sovereign hand, all of it was in fulfillment of the promise of God. Galatians 3.16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. Do you see what Paul just did there? He says that Christ came in the fullness of time in fulfillment of a promise that God made to Abraham. Christ himself, his coming, his work, the gospel, it is a testimony to the faithfulness of God who made a promise years and years before. The bottom line is our God is faithful and the word of God testifies to his faithfulness on every single page. While you cannot know a lot of things, while we might, be, while we might feel storm-tossed so often, in the dark, ignorant, unsure, as if we know nothing or can know nothing, we can absolutely know and believe this, that not one single promise that God has made to his people those who believe in Jesus Christ, not one single promise will ever fail. It cannot. The psalmist, Psalm 119, 140, says, your promise is well tried. Meaning like gold. That's what the Hebrew word means. Like gold, which is brought through the fire again and again and again. And as it's tested, as it's well tried, as it's smelted, what happens it proves itself over and over to be purest gold. That's what the word well tried means there. But let us understand, there might be things that you desire, which the Lord has not necessarily promised to you as an individual. And here's where we have to be careful. He has not promised health to every individual. He has not promised health in this world to his people, necessarily. He has not promised every individual in his church a fruitful womb or financial success or a massive booming business. There are many things that he has not promised us specifically as individuals. But he has promised his people salvation, forgiveness of sins, imputed righteousness, perseverance and endurance, and all other things that we need in this life to press on as his people. He has promised us grace in Christ, and that his grace is sufficient. And therefore, let us trust him. Why do I say all of this? Because we must beware of the tempter. The serpent who will cause you to think that God is unfaithful or that your faith is a failure because you are not getting things that you might want, which God has not necessarily promised to you as an individual. 
Is this not a common combat tactic of the enemy? This is what the whole prosperity gospel is built on. This is the tactic of the health, wealth, and prosperity preachers who are Satan's servants. Do you understand that? You understand you should not trust every man that stands behind a pulpit. Satan's servants disguise themselves as angels of light and they speak in pulpits every Lord's Day and especially on TV. Remember this. Let this be your guide. Sarah trusted in a particular promise coming from the trustworthy God. It was to her specifically. Our faith must be directly attached to the word of God, chapter and verse. Lest we think God is not faithful or that our faith is a failure. And isn't that what they say? How many times have you heard this? The reason that you have not gotten well yet is because your faith is weak. That is so shameful. That drives people to despair. Do not believe it. And do not believe that God is not trustworthy. That is not the problem. Finally, in this section in Hebrews 11, it is an absolute rebuke to the unbelief of the Hebrews to whom he is writing. We know that the Hebrews claim to be the offspring of Abraham and Sarah through Isaac and Jacob. We see that uh, here in this letter by way of assumption. And then Jesus deals with this in the Gospels constantly. And yet the writer of Hebrews is showing them that the promise of God regarding a people that cannot be numbered, a miraculous reality considering the age of Sarah and Abraham, who is as good as dead, it is all immediately connected to faith. Trusting God's word, receiving his revelation as it unfolds. God promised and Abraham and Sarah believed and therefore the descendants came. Yes, Israel, but ultimately the entire church of Jesus Christ, as Paul teaches us in Galatians. And what's the point? How is this connected? Well, he is confronting them with the reality, the fact, that faith in response to God's promise, because he is a faithful promise maker and keeper, this has always been the way of God's people. In other words, he is saying to them, your own father and mother, whom you claim, Abraham and Sarah, were marked by faith. The very faith that he is exhorting them and us to have. And if they are not marked by this faith, if we are not marked by this faith, if they will not receive and believe the word of God, the revelation of God as it comes, then they are not the people of God, and neither are we. If they will not receive God's revelation, they are not true sons and daughters of Abraham and Sarah. They are not, in other words, the Israel of God. This is a thread that runs through the entire book from start to finish. This is how he opens the book, talking about the revelation of God, which implicitly demands what? Faith. Faith and the word of God run like train tracks through the book of Hebrews, along with other things. He says in the very beginning, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by, literally, in the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. In other words, the same God who spoke creation into existence, the same God who has spoken in the prophets in many times and in many ways, including Moses, who is a central figure in Hebrews, this same God has spoken again in his Son, Jesus Christ, who is a high priest in the order of 
Melchizedek. Jesus Christ, the Son who came in fulfillment of the previous revelation of God, coming to do all that was promised as our prophet, priest, and king, all for our salvation as was promised in the garden right after sin comes into the world. And now the Hebrews are confronted with a choice, and so are we. Will they reject this son, the climactic revelation of God, the logos in the flesh? Will they reject him and hold on to the types and shadows, the priesthood and sacrifices on earth, rejecting God's unfolding special revelation? Or will they receive him? You see, he's putting a choice before them. Faith or faithlessness? Will they reject the revelation of God in Jesus Christ, who is the fulfillment of all that came before? Will they reject God's word and revelation like Adam? Or will they believe, seeing God to be faithful like Sarah? That is the centerpiece of the book. The whole book is an argument for the supremacy of the Son as he is the fulfillment of all that was prophesied, typified, and promised. He is the revelation of God. And so the question for them is, will you walk by faith taking God at his word, his word being his Son incarnate, doing all that God promised? Because what do they want to do? They keep looking back over their shoulder. The priesthood, the temple, which was probably still standing, the sacrifices. And what is that but unbelief? Rejecting the climactic revelation of God in Jesus Christ, who is the one who fulfills it all. As our prophet, priest, and king, our priest who is sacrifice, now interceding for us in the temple above. This is why faith becomes so central in Hebrews, it is connected to the revelation of God and therefore to Jesus Christ. And therefore, the book of Hebrews is incredibly evangelistic. It's about receiving Christ above all and in place of all. But as we begin to close, the question for us this morning really is basic. Will you receive God's word, all of it by faith, especially his promises, believing that he is faithful and worthy of our trust. Will you leave doing it and believing it or not? This is the fundamental issue. And understand that a rejection of the word of God, it is to reject God, the God who has spoken in this very word. Much like we cannot know God apart from the Son, so too we cannot know God apart from his word. And like those who reject the Son also reject the Father, so also he who rejects the Word of God rejects the God of the Word. Because God comes to us in and through his Word, bringing salvation and sustaining us as his people. Therefore, let us with Sarah see that God is faithful, trustworthy, always sufficient for all our needs, spiritual, temporal, and eternal. Which means by necessity that the same is true of his word. It is pure, perfect, infallible, and errant, worthy of our faith. Psalm 1830 says this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. The psalmist in Psalm 119, 114 says, You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. That is our cry, brothers and sisters. Let us lift up our hearts to heaven and sing with the psalmist. Let us lift up our hearts and sing with the hymnist who pen these words, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not, as thou hast been 
there forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Lord, unto me. May this be our song, brothers and sisters. May this be the anthem of our souls, the banner that hangs over our homes. Great is thy faithfulness, therefore we do believe, we will believe, and live by every word that comes from his mouth. Beginning with faith in the promised Savior, Jesus Christ, the one in whom all the promises of God are yes and amen. Let's pray.